The Egyptian queen inspired history books, plays, and even the femme fatale prototype in modern movies. But what is Cleopatra most famous for? Does the drama in her life outshadow much greater achievements? Keep watching to find out. Cleopatra VII was born in 69 BC in Alexandria, the city that Alexander the Great had founded almost 300 years before. She was a member of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt and a descendant of Ptolemy I Soter, the Macedonian general who first ruled the kingdom after Alexander the Great conquered Egypt. Alexandria was one of the greatest cultural centers of the world at the time, and Cleopatra had access to education from its library and from Philostratos, one of the most renowned ancient intellectuals. She spoke seven languages, and she was the first from her family to speak Egyptian. She speaks seven languages proficiently. Were she not a woman, one would consider her to be an intellectual. This helped her form alliances and devise stratagems with a tremendous amount of people. Her knowledge of philosophy and rhetoric gave her great presence and wit. Soft-spoken and highly intelligent, she inspired and fascinated many people. You ask for one-third of the Roman Empire! Put it another way, I give to you two-thirds. Cleopatra lived in a palace built by the Ptolemaic dynasty by far the most luxurious one in the Mediterranean basin. She had two sisters and two brothers. It is unknown who Cleopatra's mother was. Threats of a Roman annexation led Ptolemy XII, Cleopatra's father, to offer lavish gifts to the Roman statesmen Pompey and Julius Caesar. Ptolemy XII was soon bankrupt and had to borrow money from, that's right, the Romans. Ptolemy was exiled and the debt was passed on to Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy XIII. In 51 BC, Cleopatra became queen of Egypt together with her brother, whom she was also married to. This was common practice for royalty in Egypt. Six months later, Cleopatra rejected her brother's authority as co-ruler. She was now sole ruler. But her first years weren't easy. There was famine caused by drought, vandalism from the Gabinian Roman soldiers, and the 17.5 million drachmas that she owed the Roman Republic because of her father. When she tried to imprison the Gabinian soldiers for torturing two Syrian negotiators, Cleopatra was chastised for interfering with the Roman Senate's business. By this time, Cleopatra's brother had gained enough power against her. Sensing a civil disturbance, Cleopatra sought alliance with the Romans, specifically General Pompey. These diplomatic maneuvers were seen as treasonous by Ptolemy XIII. 21-year-old Cleopatra was exiled to Syria, and her brother led his army there to make sure she wasn't coming back to Alexandria. On the road, Ptolemy XIII learned that Pompey was due to arrive in Alexandria. General Pompey had an impressive record of victories. This was an age of great expansion for the Roman Republic, soon to be an empire. However, there was a civil dispute going on between Pompey and Julius Caesar. Suffering a devastating defeat at the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 BC, Pompey sought refuge in Egypt. He expected the pharaoh to welcome him. But Ptolemy's advisors suggested that helping the general could be seen as a sign of uprising against the much more powerful Julius Caesar. Moreover, Pompey had connections with Cleopatra, and Ptolemy wanted to make sure she wouldn't return to the throne. So, when Pompey disembarked in Alexandria, he was stabbed to death and beheaded. Julius Caesar arrived in Alexandria just a few days later, looking for Pompey. The Egyptians showed him Pompey's head, and even Caesar was shocked at the violence. He had respected Pompey as a great general and a wise man, so he had Ptolemy's advisors, well, removed. Caesar requested a meeting with the king and queen. Cleopatra was far away, but she heard the news of Caesar's arrival. With the help of Apollodorus, a Sicilian supplier, she had herself shipped in a papyrus sack straight into the Alexandria Palace in Julius Caesar's room. With her intelligence and charm, she gained Julius's trust and used it to gain, once again, control over her brother. Caesar was already upset at Ptolemy XIII for beheading Pompey, and he wanted money for repayment of the debts left by Cleopatra's father. 
These instruments tabulate the money that was borrowed by His Majesty's illustrious father, Ptolemy XII. In the name of the Republic, I have come to collect. Didn't take much for him to start supporting Cleopatra. Soon the two also started a relationship. This angered Ptolemy, who entered into a hostile conflict with Caesar. Even though Caesar was outnumbered at first, he called for reinforcements and defeated the pharaoh at the Battle of the Nile. Ptolemy drowned, and Cleopatra now ruled Egypt. In 47 BC, she and Julius had a son, Ptolemy Caesar, or Caesarian. This was a good and prosperous time for both Cleopatra and Egypt, which saw a cultural boom under its new queen. The following year, she organized an expedition to Rome, bringing her son to Caesar's palace. Caesar was at the height of his power, having brought social and political reforms to Rome. He introduced Cleopatra to the people, but the popular opinion saw her as a stranger and didn't approve of their relationship. In 44 BC, after being named dictator for life, Caesar was assassinated by his Senate colleagues. Octavius, who was going to be the first Roman emperor, and Mark Antony, a renowned general, left Rome on a mission to find Caesar's traitors. Mark Antony had met Cleopatra when she was just 14 and described love at first sight. Now a decade later, he requested to meet the queen in Tarsus, in modern-day Turkey. He wanted Cleopatra to explain her role in the aftermath of Caesar's death. Cleopatra. Cleopatra arrived in the city on a golden ship with purple sails, dressed as the goddess Isis. This display, which had become Cleopatra's trademark in Alexandria, impressed Mark Antony. This would be the beginning of their passionate but tragic love story. Cleopatra invited Mark Antony to spend time with her in Alexandria. They revered the mystical god Dionysus and lived hedonistic lives. If I must prostitute myself for the good of my country and my family, I will. When they weren't together, they would send each other letters. Mark Antony had a wife, Fulvia, in Rome. In her husband's absence, Fulvia would defend his interests against the growing power of Octavius. In 40 BC, Cleopatra gave birth to twins, Helios, the sun, and Selena, the moon. Mark Antony's wife had died, and he decided to join Cleopatra in Egypt. However, Octavius didn't agree to their relationship and obliged Mark Antony to marry his sister, Octavia. As consul general, Mark Antony was very powerful in the Roman Empire. He managed all the eastern provinces while Octavius managed the western side. Unthreatened by Octavius' disapproval, and even though he was married to Octavia, Mark Antony married Cleopatra in Antioch. Octavius didn't let this go. He felt threatened by a potential coup from the couple. Rumors started spreading about Antony intending to move the Roman capital from Rome to Alexandria. Octavius seized Mark Antony's will and showed the people of Rome that Antony was leaving Roman possessions to a foreign woman who, Octavius said, wanted to rule over the civilized world. Civil unrest broke between the supporters of the couple and those of Octavius. In 31 BC, at the Battle of Actium, Cleopatra accompanied Mark Antony, leading her own fleet, but left when a defeat was obvious. However, she announced a victory to the people of Egypt. Following the battle, the Roman Republic had become the Roman Empire. Octavius's power over Egypt was indisputable. Octavia promised Cleopatra she would forgive her if she would kill her husband. Cleopatra ignored the request and tried to motivate a very demoralized Mark Antony, hoping to regain power together and take back Egypt. Cleopatra was doing something else, seeking a painless way to die if worse came to worse. When the Roman army entered Alexandria, Cleopatra fled, but Mark Antony had received false news that she had died. Mark Antony tried to end his own life by stabbing himself in the heart, but he missed, and his death would be slow and painful. Cleopatra found Mark Antony while he was still alive. He urged her to cooperate with Octavius to save herself. Then he died in her arms. By his own hand. That is how nobility dies. At Mark Antony's funeral, Cleopatra injured herself and got an infection. Octavius ordered doctors to give Cleopatra the right care, but she refused, wanting to die like her lover. Thoughts of her children, unsafe at the hands of Octavius, made her accept the medicine. 
Then, Cleopatra was taken as a prisoner to Rome, humiliated in front of crowds. Her son, Ptolemy Caesar, was murdered. The twins would be raised by Octavia. In 30 BC, nine days after Mark Antony's death, Cleopatra planned her own death. Historians still debate whether she had a venomous snake biter or she took poison prescribed by her physician. After Cleopatra's death, Egypt became a Roman province, but Cleopatra's legacy as the last Ptolemaic ruler of Egypt is a strong one. The queen popularized the idea of ruler worship, which had a great influence on the way Rome and other Western empires would be governed. Ironically, it would also influence Octavius, who would adopt the name Augustus as the first Roman emperor. 2,000 years later, Cleopatra's life still influences books, plays, and films. Shakespeare's famous play, Antony and Cleopatra, written in 1606, was inspired by Plutarch's stories of Cleopatra. There's over 20 films which depict the life of the queen and many other stories inspired by it. What was Cleopatra's greatest achievement? And what else would she have achieved if she hadn't met such a tragic end? Let us know what you think in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe.